I'd written on my notes here that um, my name's Steve Judd, but I don't need to tell you that now. It is great to be here with you today. Uh, I have the pleasure of exploring the Gospel of Matthew with you today in the last of this three-week mini-series in Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 34. So let me encourage you to keep that open in front of you as we explore this passage together and you can check to make sure that uh, I'm telling you the right thing. The big picture we're going to be exploring is leadership God's way <clears throat> and what we're going to see is that God turns the worldly view of leadership upside down. Think about some of the world leaders and the kind of leadership they demonstrate. Leaders like Putin, Xi Jinping if that's how you say it, uh, Boris Johnson uh, or Donald Trump, and I'm sure there's plenty of others. Leaders that seem more concerned about themselves than those that are supposed to be leading. I was going to put, um, what's the current US president's name? Uh, Biden, that's him. But I thought sleeping during, you know, <laughs> during parliament's not that big a deal. So. Um, but in these leaders, we see actions that are driven by greed and power. Leaders that ha seem to have no qualms about using uh, violence to get what they want, and leaders that never seem to know when it's time to go. Even in Australia, we've had periods where we seem to change prime ministers on a regular basis, with people prepared to stab each other in the back to get the job, top job. Is this what God expects from leaders in his kingdom? The Bible provides an answer to that question uh, of what it means to be a leader in God's ki kingdom. And the answer that Jesus gives is not what you might expect. What Jesus calls his leaders to is not the kind of leadership we see in our world. So let's explore God's word together and see what he has to say. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we have the freedom to meet together as your people. We give thanks that you have revealed yourself to us through your word and that we have the privilege of being able to explore your word together today. Please give us open hearts and minds to hear your message to us today. Father, most of all, we give thanks that you show your love and grace to us in sending Jesus to die in our place and that we see the promise of eternal life in his resurrection. Help us today to give you the praise and glory you deserve and to encourage each other as your children. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You might ask the question, what is a kingdom? Kingdom's not a word or concept that we use a great deal these days but it was a concept that the people of Jesus' time were very familiar with. The broad definition of a kingdom is a country, state or territory ruled by a king or queen. So logically, the kingdom of God is a place that's ruled by God. And at one level, this is absolutely right. But the kind of rule um, that God brings is very different to the rules that we see in the world. I want us to think just a little bit about the world that the disciples were living in. So the, the world at the time of this passage. They were part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was huge. It included Spain, France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Israel, Egypt, and North America. Big, big space. And it actually, this is what it was at the time of, of Jesus in 33 AD, it continued to grow until it reached its maximum size in, in 117 AD. It was one of the greatest and most influential civilizations in the world and it lasted for a thousand years. The Jews were an occupied nation that longed for freedom. Now, if you're a Monty Python fan, you might at this point say, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> At a human level, it kind of makes sense. This is the world that the Jews were living in. 
it makes sense that the Jews were expecting a warrior king. They were expecting this big, powerful king who would come and wipe out the Romans and free them from occupation. And logically, if Jesus is God, then it would have been easy for him to call on heavenly intervention to win what seems to be an impossible battle. Tiny little uh, Jewish people against this huge Roman Empire. They would need God to make that battle win. Jesus came to establish God's kingdom, but it's a very different kind of kingdom to the kind of kingdom that the Jews were used to and were expecting. Jesus turns the idea of a kingdom upside down as well as the idea of leadership. And with it, expectations of, of leaders also turned upside down. So when we talk about God's kingdom, what do we mean? Well, God's kingdom, the, the term kind of exists at two levels, which is common with biblical thoughts. At one level, it refers to heaven, our ultimate home, but on another level, it refers to our lives now. God's kingdom exists whenever we acknowledge God as our king. So if you've accepted God as your king, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and saviour, then you belong to the kingdom of God. If we belong to the kingdom of God, then it's important that we try to understand his kingdom and how it works. Now, there's lots and lots of things that we need to learn about the kingdom of God. And today, Jesus is focusing on teaching what kind of people we need to be in his kingdom, especially leaders. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the 12. These are the ones that are closest to him. Now, we, we kind of tend to call them disciples, but later they became known as apostles because technically we're all disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And when Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives the 12 a mission to spread the gospel and to lead and grow his church. And that's what an apostle is, someone who leads God's people. Jesus establishes his kingdom through his death and resurrection. We see in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, we see that Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for his death and resurrection. That of those events that bring in the kingdom. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So it's obviously something very important and something that he needs to explain to them over and over again. And so when we get to uh, today's passage, Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 19, Jesus is once again trying to explain to him about his death. He tells them that he's going to Jerusalem to his death, not just his death, but to be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. He is willingly sending himself into battle. He is willingly going to his death because that's God's plan. Jesus knows that he's going to be subjected to huge amounts of pain, but there's no other way to achieve God's plan. God's plan to save us. So he humbly and willingly goes to Jerusalem and to the pain and death that awaits him there. This is the third and final time that he uh, tells the disciples what's going to happen. He's trying to warn and prepare them for what's coming. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that the disciples are a bit slow. 
And to be perfectly honest with you, if you're thinking that, I think you're right. They don't really seem to understand the real meaning of this. In some ways, for me, it's encouraging that the 12 appear to be so stupid, uh, and yet Jesus is patient and loving. It gives me some hope. I might be stupid, but Jesus continues to love and encourage me. Matthew records no reaction to this um, warning that Jesus gives them. There's no reaction by the 12. And to me, it kind of feels a little bit like they're more worried about themselves than Jesus. It's like they're thinking, yeah, 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 you've told us that already. Um, we don't really need to hear it again. Can we now get down to the really important stuff? We know that you're going to bring in your kingdom. What we really want to know is how important we're going to be in your kingdom. I mean, after all, come on. We got in on the ground floor. We've been touring with you for three years. We've been close to you. Surely we've earned a really good place in your kingdom. Despite the parable of the workers that Fadi talked about last week, where all the workers were paid the same generous wage, regardless of how long or hard they worked, the disciples were still asking the wrong, dumb questions. Jesus had taught them to pray, thy kingdom come, something that we still pray today, perhaps without understanding what it really means. It's something that the Jewish people had been looking forward to for many years. And the fact that Jesus taught them to pray for it means that it's important. The irony is that God's kingdom is so different to what they had imagined. It's so different to what the worldly standard of a kingdom is when compared to the kinds of kingdoms the disciples were used to, um, it's all upside down. And they're struggling to come to see the reality of God's kingdom, God's way. It would take a lot of learning for them to see past their own preconceptions of what they expected Jesus to do. I think this is a problem that uh, we still suffer from today. Jesus had been trying very hard to teach his disciples about the kingdom, um, but it's a bit like trying to explain an orange to someone that only understands apples without actually giving them an ap apple. If you are talking to somebody that only understands apples and you're trying to explain what an orange is, you might say something, conversation might go something like this. Okay, it's round and it's orange. Oh, you, you mean red? No, I mean orange. <laughs> no, can't be orange. I only know red, so it's got to be red. That's the kind of conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So understanding the kingdom is important. If the kingdom of God is the place where God is king, then it would be easy to be too literal at this point and say that God is king of everything already. But what God wants is people that acknowledge him as king and live their lives in accordance with his will. The challenge is to accept and understand what that means, not based on what we think, not based on our own preconceptions, but based on what God says. It's exactly the problem the disciples have. Their own worldly views are getting in the way and Jesus is trying to correct them. It was important for them and it's still important for us. After all, it's what we're supposed to seek first. So if we go back to Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has been trying to teach the disciples what the kingdom of God is like using parables. And there was a lot of them. Parables like the sower, the weeds, 
the mustard seed, the hidden treasure and the pearl, the net and the unmerciful servant. And then in chapter 18, Jesus tells them that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is like a little child. The greatest in the kingdom is like a little child. That should shock them. The greatest in the kingdom isn't a rich, heroic warrior. It's a little child. Not what you would expect by worldly standards. God turns the worldly standards upside down. On top of all these parables about God's kingdom, last week we had the parable of the workers in the vineyard, where the moral of the story is that all workers are paid equally and generously. And I find it a bit ironic that straight after all this teaching, um, and, and particularly after this parable of the workers in the vineyard, the, stiple, the, the disciples are still thinking about what powerful position they're going to have in God's kingdom. That's human logic and it's wrong. And Jesus doesn't mince words telling them that it's wrong. He's been trying to teach them, but at this point, they just don't get it. They have blinders on. They're blinded by their own lust for power and prestige. In chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, we see this desire for power and prestige in a mother's request. So the mother of James and John comes to Jesus and kneels before him asking for a favour. Now, bowing was a Jewish custom that was the normal protocol when you're approaching someone of higher rank. So I think that we can assume that she kneels because she acknowledges that Jesus is a higher rank. She sees Jesus as a king, or at least someone that she's expecting to become a king. But we see that she's also kneeling with selfish ambition. She wants good for her sons and perhaps to gain a little something for herself at the same time. She's seeking a reward from the king. The way she asks the question suggests that she believes he has the power to grant it. In some versions, this verse is translated as, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit at your left and right. She knows that he's got the authority and she knows that he has a kingdom. There's some truth to what she believes, but there's also a lack of understanding. What she asks for is no simple request. She's basically asking for her sons to have the highest positions in the kingdom other than the king. But in verse 22, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. In other words, Jesus is saying, you don't understand the kingdom of God. Then we get this slightly strange discussion in the passage where Jesus asks them, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Now he's addressing this to the disciples, not, not to the mother. The term cup I drink was a term that was used to describe the judgment and death of uh, crucifixion and the humiliation that came from it. That was the cup that Jesus had to drink. The disciples bravely declare that they can, but we're kind of left with the feeling that they don't really understand what they're agreeing to. It feels a bit like uh, false bravado. So Jesus tells them that they will indeed drink from his cup, but to sit at the right or left is not for him to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by his father. It's God's plan. The whole thing is his plan and he's the only one that can make that call, God the Father. I'm sure that in the years to come, both James and John would look back on this event and feel embarrassed that they asked. They also both kind of metaphorically drank from the same cup of Jesus in that they both would die because of their belief in Jesus. Out of the 12, uh, James was the first apostle to be martyred. Uh, he was beheaded by King Agrippa I. 
and John was the last to die. Both died because of their belief in Jesus. John mostly, most likely died of old age after being exiled to a penal island called Patmos for three years, uh, which also happens to be where uh, he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, it's uh, believed that he was most likely about 95 years old when he was exiled to Pax Patmos. So I can imagine they were three very difficult years for him on that island. Are you familiar with the word or the term shotgun? I don't mean the rifle. It's kind of a, a weird expression. I don't really know where it comes from, uh, but it's a weird expression uh, that means I'm claiming the best position. Usually it means I'm claiming the front seat of the car. Now, if you know the feeling that you get when someone else calls shotgun, that's exactly how the other 10 disciples felt here. They were all thinking, why didn't we think of that? We should have got in first before these guys. And how clever were James and John to get their mother to do the dirty work for them. They weren't indignant because they thought it was wrong. They were indignant because they were too slow and hadn't got in first. The remaining 10 disciples uh, suffer from the same problem as James and John. They don't really understand what God's kingdom is. And they wanted uh, what they perceived to be the best positions in the kingdom for themselves. And Jesus is thinking, you don't understand the kingdom of God. Let me try and explain. And again, we see the patience of Jesus. He doesn't get angry. He just uses the opportunity to teach them what a real leader is in God's kingdom. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. These are the leaders that Jesus has called hypocrites. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. That is, a slave is even lower than a servant. A servant is paid, a slave isn't paid. Both lowly positions, but the slave is lower than the servant even. So the greatest in God's kingdom needs to be a slave. The example they must follow is Jesus. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, who is God, came to give his life for us. In the world, the king demands that his subjects serve him. God turns that upside down. In God's kingdom, the greatest become slaves. The disciples didn't understand. The world expects leaders to be selfish people. Jesus expects leaders in God's kingdom to be humble servants. He expects them to follow his example. The humble servant, he gives his life for the sake of his people. There is a reward for all who put their trust in Jesus, but it's not the material world, rewards of this world. Following Jesus isn't gonna put a Ferrari in the garage. It's not gonna give you trophies or a statue built in your honor. It's humble service and eternal life. It's the assurance of knowing God's grace and mercy. It's knowing that our future is guaranteed because it doesn't rely on us. Now, the order of events in the Bible is by God's plan. And at first glance, this final little story about the two blind men that receive sight um, may not seem to be connected um, with all this talk about God's kingdom, but I believe that it is.
and it's part of what God is trying to teach us. As Jesus continued his journey towards Jerusalem and the fate that awaited him there, a large crowd followed him. It seems that the disciples weren't the only ones with the wrong view of what Jesus had come into the world to achieve. We see evidence of an expectation that something big was about to happen. So as Jesus travels down the road uh, with this crowd around him, there are two blind men sitting on the roadside. They would have been in a busy spot, begging, probably somewhere near the entrance to the city. This would have been their normal daily routine because as blind men, their only means of survival would have been begging. Now, given that they're blind, the only way they could have known that Jesus was there was by asking people and seeing the commotion that was going on. They heard that Jesus was going by, so they shouted out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, the crowd aren't real keen on this. Maybe they feel a bit like these beggars on the side of the road have no right to bother this VIP, this man who's about to become a king. So they tell them to be quiet. Now, I'm pretty sure that that's probably not quite the way they worded it. Um, I'm sure you can use your imagination to give you a more realistic wording of how that uh, was shared with them. Uh, but the reality is the crowd are not keen on them. But the blind men, knowing that this was an opportunity that would never come again, shouted even louder. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And to the shock of the crowd, Jesus stops and calls to them. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Their cries reveal desperation. They may have heard stories about Jesus. They may have heard that he healed other blind men. And they're no doubt uh, hopeful that Jesus will heal them too. The term son of David is a well-known Jewish term referring to God's promised Messiah. And so by referring to Jesus as Lord, son of David, they are acknowledging, acknowledging Jesus to be that promised Messiah, their Lord and King. Even though they don't have eyesight, they could see the truth. They recognised who Jesus is and they have faith in him. And Jesus takes compassion on them. He touches their eyes and immediately they receive their sight. So here's these men who have been blind with no way to survive other than to beg. And now they've been miraculously healed. They can see. They now have the freedom to do things they could never have done before. They could even start to get a job and make money. They have the potential to lead normal lives. So how do they respond to this gift that Jesus has given them? And the scripture just very simply tells us that immediately they received their sight and followed him. Wow. Not only did they have their sight, they had great insight. They could see what was important. They left behind the opportunities for greatness that their sight has potentially given them and they followed Jesus. No hesitation. What a wonderful example for us. Now, as we come to the end of this passage, it's important for us to think about us and God's kingdom. How does what God is teaching us here apply to us? What do we take away from today's passage? We all have the responsibility of sharing the gospel. And while Jesus' words here are to his 12 apostles, they are also applicable to us. We belong in God's kingdom. We are his children. 
And he calls us to be humble servants. He calls us to serve one another. It's also important to note that um, earlier we, we marvelled at the stupidity um, of the Gospels, but it's important to note that the apostles eventually become smart. Now, you might wonder, given how stupid they seem to be, uh, how does this happen? Well, the apostles change when they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After the Spirit comes at Pentecost, they have God living in them and they become new people and they finally get it. We see it in the way that they lived the rest of their lives. They get over their preoccupation with the kingdom the way they think it should be and they finally can live in the kingdom the way God intends it to be. We see it in the way they live and we see it in the way they died. We too have the Holy Spirit. If you, if you have accepted Jesus as your King and Saviour, then God lives in you through the Holy Spirit. It's just an amazing thing, something that continues to boggle my brain and something that I believe we don't celebrate enough. We have God's word and we have the Holy Spirit to convict us of the truth of his word. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, then follow his example and live life upside down. We need to live as humble servants. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Lots to give thanks for there. Uh, God's plan. It's a wonderful plan. And 